All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we're looking at a very important, important section because it tells us what happens if you delay salvation. Delay salvation and go to hell. Acts 24. Tonight we're looking at verses 22 through 27. Delay salvation and go to hell. A rather somber, sober thought, but it's happening all around us. People who have heard the gospel of Christ and for many different reasons decide to postpone believing and trusting. And they postpone until it's too late. Some postpone because they're having fun. Some postpone because they think salvation is for old people and they'll wait till they get old. Some postpone, as we see in our text tonight, because they're interested in material things and they want a little bit more than they've got. The most dangerous, most deadly, most pernicious, most stupid thing that you can do if you're not saved is putting it off because soon it will be too late. Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 22. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. Now, Paul has just told him that because of the resurrection, that is the reason he's being judged. So Felix has heard it. It says, having a more perfect knowledge of that way. He knew the way. He had an intellectual knowledge and a scent of the way. He knew about the Lord Jesus Christ, but he defers the discussion. Verse 23. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty. He knew that Paul was not guilty. But he also knew that there's not much that he could do about it. And he had an ulterior motive, as we'll see in just a moment. And that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. Sort of a very loose house arrest here. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, very interesting. Some interesting things that we learn about Drusilla in history also in relation to Pompeii. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. The Apostle Paul never pulled any punches. We don't have everything that Paul said, but we have a summary of it in the next verse. But you know what Paul preached. You know where he, what he preached everywhere he went. In every city, in every synagogue, whether he was standing before Jews or before Gentiles. And Felix was curious. I'd like to hear this fellow. And so here's what Paul preached. The faith in Christ, and verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. The Word of God brings conviction of sin. When the Word of God is proclaimed, you have several options. Number one, it might be too difficult for you to understand, so nothing happens. Number two, you might understand it and decide to harden your heart. Number three, you might come under conviction of sin and be brought to the point of repentance, but back away. Number four, you might be brought to the point of repentance and crumble before God so that he can build you back up. Felix got to point number three. 
he trembled. He came under conviction. Dear people, I think that at times there have been those here who have come under conviction and decided they did not want to go any further. That's a very dangerous position to be in, as we'll see tonight. As Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He didn't like the pressure. He didn't like the feeling of conviction. Some people, when they come under conviction, cross their arms, stone their faces like adamant, harden their hearts, stiffen their necks like the Jews did in the Old Testament, and choose not to repent. Have you ever been like that? Others are wishy-washy like Felix, and they just sort of put it aside. They don't want to think about it. Are you like that? Different responses, but the same result. You can be stubbornly rebellious, or you can be wishy-washy and put it off, but the same result. I'll put it off. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. He had another motive in verse 26. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul that he might lose him. <laughs> Sounds like third world countries today. You need something to be done, you have to have grease money. Everybody pays the petty bribes. You know that if you have ever traveled overseas, that if you want to get something done quickly, you have to keep shelling out small amounts of money all along the way to get any kind of paperwork done in any kind of office, even though they should be doing it, and you see everybody sitting around and they have nothing to do but you've got to give him a bribe. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener. Do you realize that he was only digging his own grave? <laughs> if he had heard him just that once and then put him back in prison and never heard him again, he would have been accountable for the one message. But because he was greedy, he kept listening to Paul Oh, I would hate to be in his shoes. I would hate to be named Felix when standing before Jesus. How often did you hear Paul? About 322 times. You mean you heard him that often and you never responded? Was it you didn't understand? Well, no, I understood. Uh, was it that what he was asking you to do was very difficult? Well, no, it wasn't. It was just to believe. Why was it that you put him off? Why did you listen to him so often? I was hoping for money. How many people compromise their Christian faith for money? Oh, they don't do it the same way that Felix did it but they compromise their Christian faith for money. Something their job requires them to do that is not quite in harmony with Scripture, but they sort of sear their conscience and just go ahead and do it anyway. Because it's money. Colossians 3.5 Ephesians 5.5 Covetousness is idolatry. 
and the covetous man is an idolater. You see, Felix was an idolater. Oh, not merely because he was a Roman who worshipped the pagan gods, but he had something much higher than his pagan gods. He had a love of money. Not money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil, which, while some, having coveted after, have turned from the faith. That's what happened to Felix. He erred. He turned from the faith. He had opportunity, but he rejected the opportunity because he had a love for money. Is money one of the things that motivates you? Be careful. You're on the brink of idolatry. Does money motivate you? You say, well, I haven't gotten to the point of idolatry yet. I'm not really that covetous. Does money motivate you? Or is it only secondary because you are motivated by service for Christ and that is merely a tool that you can use in his service? They're very close, but they are an eternity apart. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room and Felix, ah, here we have another of his motives. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. He wanted to go out in style. He wanted to make sure that the report that got back to Rome when Portius Festus came in was Hey, everything is peaceful. There is no trouble. The Jews are not raising a ruckus about something. It's all cool. Felix has done a great job here. Is that how you like to make your exit? Of course. Everybody wants it to look good when they leave. The question is, have you done right? Those are some pretty big questions that we look at as we go through this passage. Now recall last time in Acts, which was back on March 20th, in between was Resurrection Sunday and the marriage and the resurrection message. But last time we were in Acts, we looked at pestilent Paul and pompous people, where we had Ananias the high priest coming down with all the elders and with a, a professional orator named Tertullus who informed the governor against Paul. Been some time since then, Two years, as a matter of fact. Paul has sat bound for two years. Now you say, well, wasn't that a waste of time? I mean, how would you like to be incarcerated for two years when you are not guilty? And then the guy in charge who knows you're innocent and to whom you have made your case over and over and over again decides to leave you in jail while somebody else comes in and takes over. Was that a wasted two years in the life of the Apostle Paul? Think back about your own life. Have you ever had a period of time where you look at it and you say, man, that was a waste. You know, in the sovereignty of God, those were two years that were not a waste. God gave to Felix more opportunity than he did to Pharaoh. God used the Apostle Paul to proclaim the gospel freely because anybody could come to him that wanted to. Paul didn't have to travel anywhere and Paul had all of his expenses covered. His friends were able to come to him. He was able to hold Bible classes. He was able to train the believers and nobody interfered with training the believers. The Jews couldn't come in and break it up. Others were able to come. People could be brought to him who could talk to him. He could share the gospel with him. And he kept getting opportunity to go back to the palace and talk to the ruler. We might think of it as a waste of time, but Paul didn't. Paul used it wisely. 
He accomplished a lot during that period of time. Now, we're never told, as we said last week, what happened to the 40 assassins, but they either broke their vow or they ended up starving to death. I think they probably broke their vow. We talked about Ananias, the high priest, coming down, obviously a very major case that was involved here. They didn't hire a Jewish lawyer. They hired a lawyer, Tertullus, a Roman lawyer, uh, who brought the charges. He was called a herator, a forensic advocate trained in logic and argumentation. The guy was well trained. They could pay for the best. They got the best. He did a lousy job because he had no case. It says he informed the government against Paul. That's emphanizo, which means to put on a display or exhibit in person, but he had no exhibits to show. Then verse 2, when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, and then we went over all of the sweet things that Tertullus said. We talked about Roman courts being highly organized and orderly. We talked about the three different points of oratorical skills that are worth noting that Tertullus exercised in this passage. We talked about how Tertullus does what every person wants to hear and feel. He expresses an attitude of gratitude. And we spend some time on the attitude of gratitude and how important that is to be appreciative, but genuinely so, not hypocritically so, as Tertullus, to those who have done what is good and right and helpful. And then we saw him using a debate trick, an attention grabber, where he begins to use the name of his judge and talk about all the wonderful things that his judge has done. He expresses humility. He gives a character compliment. He promises to be short. <laughs> all of those things the judge likes to hear. And then he launched his attack against Paul. We have found this man a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout all the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Accusations in four different categories, and supported by the trial court at the lower level, which was the trial court at Jerusalem. The problem is, they were all false accusations. That Paul is a troublemaker by nature, a pestilent fellow. That Paul is a mover of sedition. He's trying to overthrow the Roman government. He's involved in treason. That he affects not only your jurisdiction, but he affects treason throughout the entire Roman Empire. And that he's not just a munchkin in the movement, he's a ringleader of the Nazarenes. And he is a leader in the sect, which has already been found to be criminal because the leader, the founder of it, was crucified under Roman law. Then he comes with the real charges, but he's already poisoned the well. The real charges relate to Judaism, who has gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. In other words, we're doing everything legally. We've always done everything legally. Uh, you know, don't mention the assassins. But we're always doing things legally, but he's the one that's breaking the law. And your underling broke the law by bringing him to you. And he goes on about the chief captain, Lysias. And then Paul closes, and we'll skip over the rest of that. We don't need to review it again. Down to verse 21. Except it be for this one voice, Paul says, that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. And then that portion of text which we just read. Salvation. Salvation is the issue. Paul reasoned with Felix. He also spoke with Drusilla, who was a Jewess, who should have known better than marrying a Gentile. He spoke concerning the faith in Christ. He spoke of righteousness, temperance, judgment to come. He not only talked about the past, he talked about the future. Oh, that we might gain a view of the future. We do that when you take the Lord's Supper. We did that this morning. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. If you really believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and what it accomplished, it changes your life. Salvation. Go your way for the present time. I'll call you when it's convenient. Salvation. Postponing salvation. 
There may be somebody here tonight who's not saved. Only God knows your heart. But you know your heart too. There's a question that's been often asked. If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Even if they could see your spirit. We live in a culture where faking Christianity has become very commonplace. All around us there are those who call themselves evangelicals and yet they promote abortion, they promote sodomy, they promote dishonesty and lying. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 that a tree is known by its fruit. They call themselves Christians, but the way they live in relation to other people raises a question. Are you like that? Salvation. Salvation is found in Jesus the Messiah alone. It goes all the way back to his birth in Luke 169. We read the words of Zechariah, And hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, speaking of the infant Jesus. Verse 77, To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, what he would do for salvation. Chapter 2, verse 30, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Chapter 3, Not just his eyes, but all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Chapter 19 of Luke, verse 9, And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, Zacchaeus. For as much as he also is the son of Abraham, Jesus was the one who brought it. John chapter 4, verse 22, Speaking to the woman at the well, Ye worship what ye know not. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. We know in whom it is. Peter tells us in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. In other words, the Creator himself. John 1.1 1, 1, takes us back to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, picked up by the book of Hebrews here in chapter 2. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That's Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You know, it's rather interesting how Hebrews phrases it. It doesn't say he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that believe on him. Because you see, Hebrews is focused on the response of faith. The heroes of faith are not merely people who believed. That's chapter 11. The heroes of faith are the ones who proved they believed by what they did. And that's why he phrases it, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Peter writes of the same, chapter 3, verse 15 of Second Peter, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Salvation is found in Jesus the Messiah alone. Point two. Salvation is available both to Jews and Gentiles. Acts 13, 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, 
to you is the word of this salvation sent, not merely those who are of the stock of Abraham. Verse 47, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Chapter 28, verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear. Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Chapter 11, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Salvation is only in Jesus, but it's available for both Jews and Gentiles. You know something? The demons understand the salvation, and they know that they can never attain it. In Acts chapter 16, we find... Paul on his way to prayer and the demon possessed young woman says she had a spirit of divination that's the spirit of python you recall we studied that python is a massive serpent that crushes its prey and swallows it whole spirit of divination is the spirit of Satan the python the serpent and in verse 17 it says the same followed Paul and us and cried saying these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. <laughs> but the demons can't have it. Christ took on humanity. He died for the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. Number four, salvation is a matter of faith that actually produces the results of a confession. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, the faith that is genuine will always produce the results of a confession. Something else that is very important for us because we live in the last days is salvation has eschatological application. It deals with things to come. It deals with future prophecy. Romans 13, 11. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. That's the eschatological application of salvation. You're saved from your sins. You're on your way to heaven. But you know something? It has a future application. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Closer than at that point whereby you were transferred from darkness to light, from the kingdom of the devil to the kingdom of God. How about 1 Thessalonians 5.9? For God hath not appointed us unto wrath. That's what's coming, folks. The wrath that he's talking about there is the great tribulation period. God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's an eschatological statement. That's a prophetic future statement. That's a statement about Jesus snatching us up at the rapture and getting us out of here before God sends his judgment on the earth. How about Hebrews 9.28? So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Future tense. The second time. First time he came for our salvation. He died for our sins. Gave us eternal life. But he's coming to deliver us again, and it's called salvation. Same word. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5 Who are kept by the power of God, you have eternal security. The power of God cannot be broken, it cannot be challenged, it cannot be overthrown. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Salvation has an eschatological application. Things to come. Peter goes on in verse 9 of 1 Peter 1, receiving the end of your faith, 
even the salvation of your souls. You see, God keeps you all the way through, not just now, not just until you sin. Your salvation brings you all the way to the end. Verse 10, of which salvation? The prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Ah, and then truly an eschatological book, the book of Revelation. We find salvation mentioned there. In fact, multiple times. We'll only read a few. Revelation 7.10, And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Chapter 12, verse 10, And I heard a loud voice, saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That is a fantastic statement of what salvation includes. The casting down of the accuser of the brethren. Chapter 19, verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. You get the idea that all of creation, as they stand before the throne, are thrilled with salvation. Are you saved? Does it thrill your soul? Do you proclaim it with a loud voice? You say, well, that's future. What does it do for me now? Point six. Salvation has practical application to the sufferings of this present time. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, 6. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual. That is, your salvation is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. The application of salvation, both the sufferings and also to consolation. And then we come to the problem that was facing Felix. The danger of delaying salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, that means I've rescued you. Behold, now, not tomorrow, not next week, not when you feel like it, not at a convenient time. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When Paul wrote that, I wonder if he was thinking back to Festus and Felix and Drusilla. I wonder if he's thinking back to Lysias and Ananias and the council. I wonder if he was thinking back to all those who had stoned him, run him out of town, hardened their hearts, laughed at him, scoffed at him. But in particular, Felix, who delayed because he wanted money. Are you putting it off? Do you know for sure that you're saved? Dear people, that's the most important question in your life. That is the most important question in your life. Do you know without question, never a shake, never a worry, never a trembling as Felix had, that maybe you're not saved? If you're truly saved, 
God gives you assurance of salvation, but you know there's some things that will keep you from having that assurance. Christ died for your sins. But if you're still playing with sin, if there are things in your life that you are not willing to give up, you're not going to have any assurance. Because those are the things that make you wobbly. And when you stop in the quiet of the night and your mind begins to race and you can't get to sleep and the Holy Spirit begins to bring you under conviction and you tremble as did Felix and you begin to push the convicting work of the Spirit away you begin to say come again when I have a more convenient time you might well question your salvation. Don't just stuff it right now. Don't just harden your heart and say, oh yeah, I've been saved for years. How has it changed your life? As you know, that's one of my favorite questions because that's the question that gets to the heart of the matter. How has it changed your life? Because true salvation changes your life. The danger of delaying salvation you say, well, you know, I, I feel pretty good about it. Did you know there's a counterfeit salvation? That's point eight. There is a counterfeit salvation, and Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 7.10. In fact, it's an emotional counterfeit. It's something that makes you feel like you're really trying to make things right with God. 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but, and here's the counterfeit, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There are people all over the world that feel sorry about things they've done. God has given every man a conscience. Romans chapter 2 teaches that. People are convicted when they've sinned. People feel sorry when they've sinned. They feel sorry especially when they get caught. Or they feel sorry especially when they get a disease for being immoral. Or they feel sorry when they get thrown into jail because they stole money and somebody saw them. That's the sorrow of the world. It works death. But godly sorrow worketh repentance not to be repented of. The sorrow that works repentance works it to salvation. You say, well, how does that happen? Point number nine, salvation includes multiple workings of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Did you know there are at least 34 of them? 34 specific things that the Holy Spirit does at the moment of salvation. 34 things that he gives to you, does in you, or does with you at the point of salvation. I think I went over those a couple of years ago. I suspect nobody wrote them all down. But listen to Ephesians 1.13. In whom, speaking of Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 is all in him, in whom, in the beloved. Multiple times in Ephesians chapter 1, he's telling you your position in Christ. That's Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3. Number one, two, and three tells you your position in Christ. Chapter four, five, and six tells you your practice in Christ. Position and practice. Position and possessions. But verse 13, talking about Christ, says, In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, uh, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, that is in Christ, 
Also, after that you believe, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Salvation includes the sealing of the Spirit. It includes the earnest of the Spirit. It includes the filling of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit does many works in the life of the believer. It includes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. These are things that not you do, but that the Spirit of God does. And that's the reason that we say, if you're truly saved, your life will change. Jesus takes you as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. He changes you by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. You say you're a Christian. How has it changed your life? Number 10, salvation is essential if we would win the spiritual warfare. Are you having a hard time in the spiritual warfare? You're always finding that you lose the battle? Did you know salvation is essential? You can't win the spiritual warfare without it. As a matter of fact, it's listed as first in the armory in Ephesians 6. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The helmet of salvation, that which guards your head, your mind, so that you don't have your brain scrambled, so that you can think clearly, so that you walk forward in the warfare, so that you know who the enemy is, where the enemy is, and what he's going to do to attack. The helmet of salvation, and it's joined to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, not the helmet of salvation, which you then add to all the philosophies of the world and try to figure things out. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, we find a very parallel passage over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Verse 11, or excuse me, point 11. Salvation always results in works of righteousness in the life of the believer. Very parallel to what we said just a moment ago. Philippians 2.12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Now, you don't just do the good stuff when I'm around. You do it when I'm gone. Man, that's the way parents like their kids to be. But now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The phrase that Paul uses is a phrase that means the outworking. That is, it's in you. Now get it out. Show it in the way that you live. The outworking of your salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Hebrews 6, verse 9 explains it to us. But beloved, we are persuaded of better things of you. You know, I've heard some things about you that are not so good. And we have the warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Warning passages that do not deal with the loss of salvation, but warning passages which deal with the loss of heavenly rewards and chastening by the Father. There are six of them in the book of Hebrews. And here's what he writes. After he scolded them, he says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Now listen to the last half of this verse. And things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. True salvation has things that accompany it. True salvation shows up in the life of the believer. Point 12. Salvation is a result of the elective purposes of God, not of the will of man. That's important. Salvation is a result of the elective purposes of God, not the will of man. I love these verses. When I found these verses, I thought, wow, there it is, black and white, proof that God shows us to salvation. It says so. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks to God for you always, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning When's the beginning? Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, from that, somewhere back there, somewhere before creation, from the beginning, 
God hath chosen you to salvation. And he tells us the method by which he did it. Through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Sanctification doesn't mean just being holy. Hagi, hagios, the saints, those are the ones who have been set apart. God takes and sets you apart for certain things. We talk about many, many different things that God sets us apart for. But here he's setting us apart for salvation. This one is mine. I'm setting him apart. This one is mine. I'm setting him apart. That one is mine. I'm setting him apart. He chose you. That's that picking out of those different times and cultures and places and different groups of people and different families he's choosing and then he's setting us apart through a sanctification of the spirit it's the Holy Spirit who does it and the method that he uses and belief of the truth you know Jesus said that John 17 17 sanctify them there we have sanctification sanctify them through thy truth oh here we have it here Sanctification and truth. Salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. And then he tells us, Thy word is truth. What does God use to draw people to Christ? The reasons of men, the emotions of the flesh, or the word of truth? The scripture is a unit, folks every place that you look. 2 Timothy 2.10 Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Salvation is the result of the elective purposes of God, not the will of man. Number 13 Salvation is a matter of grace and not of works. You see, people who believe in so-called free will are suddenly placing salvation in the category of works. But listen to what Paul says to Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Salvation entails responsibilities. This is point 14. Salvation entails responsibilities from those who are saved. Hebrews 2, 3. You have some responsibilities if you're saved. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? There's some responsibility in that, isn't there? Jude 1 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you unto the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You're saved? What should you be doing? Earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Number 15, we're almost done. God uses angels to protect the elect until they are saved. God never loses anybody along the way. Romans 8, 28 through 30 makes that very clear. But how does he do it? We're told in Hebrews 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of? And all of God's people said, salvation. The angels minister them who will be his future tense there, not just after they get saved, who shall be heirs of salvation. That's an incredible thought. You think about your unsaved life. How many times did God's angels have to rescue you from death before God drew you to Christ? And finally, point 16. I alluded to it a little while ago, but God uses the scriptures to draw us to Christ and give us salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto 
salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus which brings us back to the very first point there is salvation in none other than Jesus Christ Jesus the Messiah is the only one who can provide salvation and Felix heard it and then he heard it again and then he heard it again and he knew about the resurrection he knew about the death of Christ he knew about the way he was informed his wife a Jewess would have learned the scriptures as a child she was informed but he delayed until it was too late he got replaced he got sent somewhere else he never again had to listen to the Apostle Paul he never again got to listen to the Apostle Paul have you delayed young or old have you put it off regardless of your nationality background race color creed oh many creeds but they don't point to Christ almost persuaded but not saved our gracious Heavenly Father help us not to be people who postpone knowing Christ and if we know him help us not to be people who postpone obeying him help us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling we don't work to get ourselves saved but if we are saved it does have an outworking in our lives we pray that you'll take your word as proclaimed tonight though this preacher is weak and inarticulate your word is precise and exact and father I pray that you will take the word of God convict us of sin bring us to repentance true repentance godly sorrow the works repentance not to be repented of rather than to the sorrow of the world which only works death for we pray these things in Jesus name Amen and so that's why I said one of the hymns which is not found in the other book but isn't found in your inspired